It is just past 9.54pm here at Rocket Lab's Mission Control Centre in Auckland, New Zealand, where we are counting down to the late evening liftoff of our 35th Electron launch, scheduled to take place in about 20 minutes from now. Hello and welcome to our live broadcast for a mission we have called The Beat Goes On for satellite operators Black Sky through their mission managers Spaceflight Inc. I'm Uriel Baker and tonight I am joined by Neutron Systems Engineer Imogen Ray. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Electron is now vertical and ready on pad B at Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1, our private orbital launch range on the Mahia Peninsula. Our first opportunity to launch today comes at 10.14pm local time or 9.14am UTC. If you're in the US, that timing translates to 5.14am Eastern or 2.14am Pacific. Just as well, we had that two-hour window today, given some unexpected space weather, pushing our launch opportunity out to this new T0. Thanks so much for your patience. Should we need to stand down from a launch attempt today, we have plenty of opportunities through the rest of this month. However, all launch operations are running smoothly so far with our team on the ground in Mahia and our launch operators in mission control as we approach T0. Today's launch concludes a series of missions we've flown on Electron 4, Black Sky and Spaceflight as the former builds out their Earth imaging constellation. I'll let Muriel take you through the details of this mission as well as the ones we've flown over the years. Thanks, Imogen. Today's launch is the sixth and final mission of a multi-launch deal between Rocket Lab and Spaceflight to deliver payloads to low Earth orbit for Black Sky, a real-time geospatial intelligence company. The Beat Goes On will launch on a southeastern trajectory from Launch Complex 1, carrying two of Black Sky's Gen 2 Earth observing satellites to a 450 kilometre circular orbit, where they will join and connect with other satellites in the constellation. Powered by artificial intelligence, Black Sky uses its constellation to monitor activities and locations around the world to provide valuable insights to decision makers across government, commercial and humanitarian industries. Rocket Lab has been the launch partner for many of the missions to deliver those satellites to orbit, having previously launched for them twice all the way back in 2019 and again on our 18th, 20th, 22nd, 23rd and 25th Electron missions in the years since. Here's a little bit more about the capabilities of Black Sky's Constellation. Black Sky's constellation has provided on-demand real-time Earth observation data and satellite imagery for major world events such as the war in Ukraine, the earthquake in Turkey, and even Cyclone Gabriel, which severely impacted New Zealand and the community surrounding Launch Complex 1. LDGC on mission. 
QCL. I'm the look arm and prime sequence is complete. Copy, thank you. Now, Electron's focus is small satellites like the Black Sky pair we have on board today. But we're also excited to tell you a little bit more about what's happening with our newest launcher, Neutron. We'll be building on our deep heritage and proven experience designing, manufacturing and launching Electron to develop a heavy lift capability. Neutron has a reusable first stage and is designed for mega constellations, lifting 13 tonnes to low Earth orbit, which is about 40 times the capacity of Electron. It will also deliver spacecraft to geostationary orbit and interplanetary destinations, and is being designed to be human spaceflight capable in the future. Recently, we've completed some major milestones towards our first flight in 2024 out of NASA's Wallops Flight Facility on Virginia's eastern shore, right next door to Electron's Launch Complex 2. In November last year, we kicked off operations for testing the 730 kilonewton Archimedes engine at NASA's Stennis Space Centre in Mississippi. The test complex sprawls across a 1 million square foot area, which will fast track our path to first flight. Just one month later, we completed our first test at the centre, testing Archimedes engine ignition on development hardware. With Neutron standing at 42.8 metres or 140 feet, we've also seen some large hardware arrive, including tanks for the vehicle's second stage. The second stage tanks are five metres in diameter and are designed to carry the cryogenic liquid methane and liquid oxygen propellants. Like Electron, the tanks are made from carbon composite, which keeps the stage as light as possible and maximises the amount of payload Neutron can carry to orbit. We're excited to show you more as we progress towards first flight and, as always, you can get the latest news on our socials. And with that, we are right on time to tune into our Mission Control Centre for today's launch to listen into the final go, no go poll that's about to be run by our launch director, Julia Vembaha, to check in with our operators before heading into the terminal count ahead of launch. Now, each operator will check in from their stations with the LD to confirm systems are operating as they should. Let's listen in. And to all operators, this is LD and Mission Court. We're proceeding now with the go no go sequence. Stage. Stage is go. Avionics. Avionics is go. GNC. GNC is go. Recon. Recon is go. T1. T1 is go. GC. GC is go. PLS. PLS is go. RSO. RSO is go. MET. MET is go. MM. MM is go. Recovery. Recovery is go. And LD sub. LD sub is go. The go no go sequence is complete. We are currently T minus 11 minutes and 18 seconds in counting. We are go for terminal count at T minus 10 minutes. From this time, the three word hold procedure is in effect. And that's Mission Control confirming that we will be proceeding with the rest of today's countdown and moving forward to liftoff. While today's mission is the last of a multi-launch deal for Black Sky, it is also possibly the beginning of a new phase of our recovery program to make Electron the world's first reusable small rocket. The Beat Goes On will be a marine recovery mission for our operators today, with the goal of retrieving Electron's first stage from the ocean downrange of Launch Complex 1. We've had many ocean splashdowns of Electron before. How it works is that our rocket launches to space with two parachutes attached internally to Electron's first stage. 
Once the first and second stage separate as normal, the first stage continues upwards on its trajectory before gravity brings it back down to Earth. As it descends, the first of the two parachutes, the first one we call the drogue chute, is released to help slow down the speed of the rocket's return. A few moments after that, the second and much larger main parachute is deployed to really put on the brakes and help bring Electron under a smoother, more controlled descent to the water's surface. It's here in the middle of the ocean off New Zealand's east coast that our recovery team is stationed on our recovery ship, waiting in the drop zone to meet the first stage. While previously we've used a helicopter to try and catch the rocket before it reaches the ocean, since we started pulling electrons from the water, our recovery team started to see a bit of a pattern with the return stages that they hadn't initially expected. It turns out Electron survives a swim in the ocean well enough that many of its components actually pass requalification for flight. So for this mission, we are putting the theory to the test of whether we need a helicopter at all. We've added waterproofing modifications to the stage to protect some of the key bits we want to keep dry. And depending on how well ocean recovery performs this go around, the results may convince the team to stick with marine recovery altogether. The benefit of that would mean not only big savings costs to our recovery and reusability R&D, but it would also open up more flexibility for our launch windows and take us from 50% of electron missions being suited for recovery up to as high as 70% of our missions. Today, once this stage is pulled on board the recovery ship, our team will begin the flushing and preservation steps to remove salt water, prevent corrosion and secure the stage for the return voyage to our factory, where it will be examined thoroughly to determine the next steps in our recovery and reusability program. Today's severe space weather may have impacted our ability to complete a planned ocean recovery, but we'll keep you posted on that through today's mission. Michael Daly, who is part of the reusability team, can explain this process in more detail. My name is Michael Daly. Um, I'm the Special Projects Engineer, and I'm working on the reusability project for the Electron. Um, so at the moment, recovery is focusing more on the uh, how do we get this thing on a boat and back uh, to, the, to the factory. What we're going to be doing in reuse is that back end. So processing it on the boat, what, what can we do to uh, uh, operationally to, to clean it, to, to prevent that, that corrosion buildup and, and that lasting damage that will happen over the following weeks uh, due to the salt, um, as well as uh, contributing to design changes and, and leading that sort of thing with the, the vehicle design teams, the propulsion development teams and all that kind of stuff, just to achieve a rocket that we're going to be able to use a, uh, a few times, you know. So I'm going to be located on the boat, um, and when uh, once that launch happens, um, the recovery team that we're going to be working with is going to be looking for where we're going to see a re-entry of the vehicle, um, and then preparing to uh, to go and collect it out of the water. Um, my job there is going to be supporting them initially uh, in that those operations to get out of the water, and then I'm going to move into the uh, the operations that I've been building up. So that's the operations like desalting um, the engines, trying to remove all that that bad salt water, and uh, and basically just trying to make the, the rocket survive uh, that experience with the water. We're going to be doing some modifications to the engine as well in, in terms of design to make them more resilient. Um, and we're actually calling it the Engine Resilience Project, trying to build these guys up. Um, yeah, so we're a, a mixture of these uh, desalting operations once it comes out of the water, as well as these design changes will hopefully mean that we have to do minimal testing um, once, once we get these guys back. Um, so it's going to be saving us a whole lot of money. But we're looking, looking back at our, our previous recovery, we have been able to to reuse some of those components, which gives a fantastic indication that we're going to be doing even better in this next uh, recovery, um, especially with our new operations and designs that we've been changing. So we're going to be recovering more of those components, reusing more of those. And we fully intend to be reusing some of our components coming out of that. Once it returns from flight, all of our avionics components particularly, as well as our propulsion components, we have the ability to start testing them again and seeing what they look like post. And then the propulsion side, we're going to be disassembling these engines and seeing um, what signs of corrosion is in there, if what we've been uh, changing on the engine has worked, um, and then making a game plan to, to make it work even better the next time. And that covers what we can expect from the secondary mission for ele today's Electron launch and the process as we take our next steps to make Electron the world's first reusable small rocket. 
We've spoken a lot about how Electron works, but as you'll know, the whole reason we are here today is to put our customers' satellites in orbit. And not only do we perform that primary task, but at Rocket Lab, an even larger chunk of our business is building satellites themselves and the parts they need to work properly when they're in space. Here's a breakdown of the essential components of a satellite. First, in order to leave the rocket behind, a satellite needs a separation system. One side of the system is attached to the rocket and the other is attached to the satellite itself. A timed separation event will deploy the satellite at the precise moment needed to get the spacecraft in its proper place in the skies. And these separation systems are one of the space systems components Rocket Lab provides small satellites across both our own launches on Electron and for launches on other rockets. Next, satellites can't perform their intended functions without power. So solar panels charge the batteries on the satellites that keep the sensors running so they can collect their mission data. We provide these too, from individual solar cells that make up a solar panel to multiple solar panels wired in series to create an entire solar array. You've likely seen some of our solar solutions across some of the most important missions in space recently, including the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's Parker Solar Probe and the Mars InSight Lander. Now once in space, when a satellite passes over a ground station and needs to point an antenna at the Earth or wants to point a camera at a specific location, it needs attitude sensors and actuators. And Rocket Lab builds both. Attitude sensors, like the star trackers Rocket Lab makes, determine the orientation of a satellite. They are small star finders that compare what they see in space to star maps to find out where the spacecraft is pointing. Rocket Lab also builds actuators called reaction wheels that are used to correct the satellite's pointing depending on what the star tracker says. Together, they ensure the satellite keeps the solar panels pointed at the sun and the antenna pointed at the Earth. And last but certainly not least, a satellite space software keeps the payload connected and communicating with the teams on the ground managing the mission. And that's the gist of what makes a satellite a satellite. Speaking of, let's get back to the mission at hand and see where we are for The Beat Goes On. We are just two minutes away from launch now. Electron remains in good health and the Black Sky satellites inside the fairing are good to go. The weather remains green and the path to orbit is looking clear from Launch Complex 1 at T0. Soon we'll hear the call that LOX loading is complete on Electron, telling us that the rocket is fully fuelled for launch. Then our launch director, Julia Wembacher, will be counting down the clock from Mission Control at T minus 10 seconds. We're going to hand over now to Mission Control and we'll be back after liftoff to take you through the launch milestones. All avionics batteries have switched to internal power. Ground power has been disabled. Vehicle is fully on internal power. UTS is enabled for flight. Lock slide complete, system in recirculation. Anti geysering system disabled. Stage one and stage two are pressed for flight. High flow engine purge is enabled. Deluge activated.
T minus 20 seconds and counting. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, Propulsion is nominal. All right, T plus 32 seconds, and our 35th electron mission is off the pad and on its way to orbit. The next mission milestone will be max Q. When Electron experiences the most amount of mechanical stress as it heads skyward at the intersection of vehicle speed rising and air density dropping. Electron is supersonic. Approaching max Q. Past Max Q. There it is from Mission Control. Electron has cleared Max Q and is now throttling back up to full noise as it continues onto space. We are currently travelling at a speed of 2,400 kilometres per hour and at an altitude of 22 kilometres as we approach the next mission milestones. Three in quick succession this time. First, the nine 3D printed Rutherford engines will throttle down before shutting off completely. This is known as main engine cutoff, or MECO for short. Then we'll have separation of the first and second stages, followed quickly by ignition of the single vacuum optimised Rutherford engine on Electron's second stage to carry us the rest of the way to orbit. When Electron's booster is on its way home to Earth, we will try and stick with the Stage 1 live camera feed for as long as we can so we can watch Electron's ocean recovery attempt unfold. But for now, it is back to Mission Control for those next three launch milestones. Entered Britain to deck model. Miko confirmed. Stage two ignition successful. Stage two guidance nominal. Right on cue there with Miko stage, stage separation and ignition of the stage two Rutherford engine. Next on the checklist is separating the rocket's fairing and jettisoning the nose cone that protects the payloads during flight. This middle of the night launch means it might be too dark to see the separation event on our screen, but keep an eye out anyway as we listen into Mission Control for the call out. HVB battery discharge is nominal. Ferry and Jettison succeeded. And there's Stage the confirmation we were waiting for. Electron's fairing has successfully been deployed. Stage two is continuing well with its payloads to orbit. The vehicle is currently reaching speeds of more than 8,500 kilometres per hour at an altitude of 135 kilometres.
Stage two propulsion holding nominal. All right, at over 11,000 kilometres an hour and more than 180 kilometres in the air, this first launch from LC-1 this year is going fantastic so far. After two back-to-back -back launches from LC-2, that started 2023 for Electron. That second LC-2 mission actually flew just last week, so launching today marks the fastest we have ever turned around two missions. Our previous record was 15 days in 2022 between Capstone and a mission for the NRO. Back to the beak that goes on though, and as I said, all looks nominal. You can see there that stage two Rutherford engine is burning bright to orbit. Stage two guidance nominal, 200 seconds remaining. HVB battery discharge nominal, approaching hot swap in roughly 30 seconds. So with Electron second stage now at Cross over 194 kilometres in the air, the vehicle will be coming up on its next event, the action of swapping the batteries that keep the second stage's Rutherford engine going. As our 3D printed engines are powered by batteries, by this point in the launch sequence, those batteries are getting low on energy. And as you might have caught on your screen there, they have since dropped off because our engine has switched to the other set on board to keep it going. That's why we call it the battery hot swap. Electron Stage 2 continues on its way to orbit at an altitude of 198 kilometres and a velocity of 117,000, I should say, kilometres per hour. You saw it there for a brief second, but it looks like we have actually lost the video connection to Electron's booster coming back to Earth there. That's not to be unexpected, so don't panic. It's when the stage moves out of range to receive the live camera, to camera telemetry. We are still expecting the first stage's main parachute to deploy shortly at about eight minutes into the mission. And we'll continue to listen into mission control to hear whether that's gone ahead. Stage two performance holding nominal. Main parachute deployed on recovery. We have just zero. heard from mission control that we have just heard from mission control there that the main chute was successful. The electron is now powering its way down to 158 meters per second ahead of the stage landing in the ocean. So with a velocity of 26,000 kilometres an hour and an altitude of over 191 kilometres, the final mission milestone for the second stage will be SECO, or second engine cutoff. And that is when the Rutherford engine throttles down before shutting off just ahead of Electron's third stage, what we call the kick stage, separating and carrying on with the mission with Black Sky's payload. And as you just saw there on the screen, we have had that successful shutdown of that second stage. So it's now onward for our third stage to deploy those satellites to orbit. Black Sky satellites are heading to a circular orbit today, but at the moment our kick stage is on an elliptical first pass. 
To get into the required circular orbit, we have a tiny engine on the kick stage called Curie that will course correct the mission by orienting the kick stage on the right trajectory for payload deployment. We won't have live video of this payload deployment for this mission, but we will be back to listen out for those final few calls from Mission Control, along with an animated view of the end of the mission to visualise what is happening up there in low Earth orbit. Meanwhile, for recovery, the Stage 1 splashdown is expected in approximately eight minutes. We'll come back from our break to watch and discuss while the camera feed is up, if we can get it. So stick with us for confirmation of that shortly. We'll see you back here soon.
in the break there from Mission Control from our recovery operators, confirming that the Electron Booster has reached the ocean as planned. Our recovery ship will be moving fast now to reach the first stage as quickly as possible and get it on board the ship and secured for transport back to the mainland. Congratulations to the recovery team and all of the Rocket Lab team who have worked on this recovery operation. It is not an easy thing to bring a rocket back to Earth, but they have done it again. We will share more updates on how Electron fared as the first stage and our team begin their journey home. We'll share those updates on our social media channels. But meanwhile, we are still a while away from the deployment of this mission's payloads for Black Sky, so we'll be taking another break on this webcast before coming back for payload deployment in around 40 minutes. Thanks for joining.